We want to welcome you to another Haynes Ministries of Word and Do season. I'm Steve Haynes. And I'm Susan Haynes. And I'm Danielle Vaughn. And I'm Joshua Stephen Haynes. And we're going to have a great time tonight. We're going to have a great time in the Word of God. Uh, we're going to finish up the book of Acts tonight. Uh, last week we went over three chapters. We went over uh, Acts chapter 25, 26, and 27. And we found that Paul stood before at a trial before Festus. And uh, so anyway, and then Agrippa got in on the on the scene. Uh, oh, he stood with the trial before Felix, and then he went to Festus. And then Agrippa was there, uh, and he was in on it too. And before we read anything, I want to ask my wife Susan to go ahead and open up with prayer. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for the privilege to come together and to learn your word. We pray that your anointing would be upon us and you would reveal your truth to us by your Holy Spirit. And uh, let us just go forward victoriously with your word hidden in our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 I think uh, before we get into Acts chapter 27, I want to read Acts chapter 26. Uh, it's starting in verse 28. And it says, and I'm reading from the New International Version, the NIV. It says, Then Agrippa said to Paul, Do you think that in such a short time you can persuade me to be a Christian? Paul replied, Short time or long, I pray God that not only you, but all who are listening to me today, because uh, I mean, listening to me today may become what I am except for these chains. The king rose and with him the governor and Bernice and those sitting with them. They left the room and while talking with one another, they said, this man is not doing anything that deserves death or imprisonment. Agrippa said to Festus, this man could have been set free if he had not appealed to Caesar. And I think Paul knew deep down he could persuade and and you know and and get it could have gotten out of all that but he knew that jesus wanted to send him to rome that's mm -hmm. right and the rome was where he was going to go uh he was uh, you know just bent on doing god's will and doing what he knew jesus wanted him to do and so he he didn't want to be set free he didn't want to be acquitted he he wanted to go on to rome and he knew that was his way to go. And uh, we're getting ready to start in Acts chapter 27. In verse 1, it says, When it was decided that we would sail for Italy, Paul and some other prisoners were handed over to a centurion named Julius, who belonged to the Imperial Regiment. Uh, we boarded a ship from Andromedium, about to sail for ports along the coast of the province of Asia. And we put out to sea. Aristarchus, a Macedonian from Thessalonica, was with us. The next day we landed at Sidon, and Julius, in kindness to Paul, allowed him to go to his friends so that they might provide for his needs. May I interrupt just yeah. a second here? And, you know, be sure when you're reading your Bible, you look at the little maps. You know, my Bible has it right nearby, but some you have to look in the back. And make sure at least later you go back and, and trace Paul's route. Sometimes they'll have them traced for you. But, but look at these um, uh, cities that we're reading here and the different places, the route. To me, it's, it comes together much better if you can actually see it on the map. But I just want to point out, <clears throat> no matter what you're going through or where you are, it seems God will always show favor. Just like when Joseph was in prison, he had favor with the guards. And here Paul's uh, in chains, and he's, he's found favor with the guards. So no matter what you might be going through, God will always show you favor, whether you're bond or That's free. True. Amen. Amen. Amen, he will. So I just wanted to point that out. I like that. And uh, anyway, in verse 4, 
Acts 27, 4, it says, From there we put out to sea again and passed to the lee of Cyprus because the winds were against us. When we had sailed across the open sea off the coast of Cilicia and Pamphylia, we landed at Myra in Lycia. There the centurion found an Alexandrian ship sailing for Italy and, and put us on board. We made slow headway for many days and had difficulty arriving off Nidus. When the wind did not allow us to hold our course, we sailed to the Lee of Crete, opposite Salmon. We moved along the coast with difficulty and came to a place called Fair Havens, uh, near the town of uh, Lassia. Much time had been lost and sailing had already become dangerous because by now it was after the fast. So Paul warned them, Men, I can see that our voyage is going to be disastrous and bring great loss to ship and cargo and to our own lives <coughs> also. But the centurion, instead of listening to what Paul said, followed the advice of the pilot and of the owner of the ship. Since the harbor was unsuitable to winter in, the majority decided that we should sail on, hoping to reach Phoenix and winter there. Uh, this was a harbor in Crete facing both southwest and, and north northwest. And they're getting ready to go through a storm here in a minute. I believe Paul was being led by the Holy Spirit when he advised not to sail. Yes. But you know, these guys aren't going to listen to him. They're going to listen to the pilot. They're going to listen to the owner of the ship. You know? Yeah, they didn't know Paul very well. So. Yeah, they didn't know Paul very well. But uh, did anybody have anything to say or... Uh, well, uh, this actually was a um, after the fast was the day re referring to the day of atonement where they were talking about um, uh, in verse nine. Um, it was after the day of atonement in late September or early October, and it was kind of getting close to the winter time that was dangerous for sailing. It was dangerous sailing weather i guess maybe they had hurricanes and stuff around that time yeah it was about to begin and they were but they were trying to find a better place this is what the captain and they were find, trying to find a better place to pass the winter and that's why another reason why they didn't listen to paul i think they didn't listen to him mostly because paul wasn't a sailor paul was a tent maker paul but and a prisoner and, and, and a prisoner uh, <laughs> and even though i mean he I, he was led in that, like he knew what was going to come, and he tried to tell them. Still, I mean, if you heard somebody who had never had any experience with what whatever it is your job is, and they say, well, you shouldn't do that, this might happen, even though yeah. you were led by the Spirit to say that, they're not going to be very quick to say, oh, well, thanks, I just won't do what I've been doing my whole life. So, I mean, I can understand that, but something else that I'd like to point out is the fact that they're sailing. And whenever we think of boats going places, we think, well, why can't? Why is it hard to go through there? Is, was the wind just so strong that it was keeping you from going? But I mean, that's how they went is through the wind. Yeah. They use whenever because it says they sailed. I mean, they didn't just take a boat out to the sea, and they don't have oars to move a large ship full of prisoners and things yeah. like that. Like, or at least any like, I I don't know. We to me, I think of whenever I think of like. I don't know, soldiers back in that time period, or at least in Viking time period. I think of them in the rowboats with their yeah. 40 paddles and two guys per paddle, and they're all going in sync and everything like that. But they didn't have that. This wasn't this kind of boat. And so, I mean, I just wanted to point out that that's why it's treacherous for them where they are because they're hardly moving since there's no wind. Yeah. And, I mean, it takes a little bit of wind to move a ginormous boat. Yeah, and they didn't have a small boat, um, but I just wanted to point that out. That Bless you. that's what that's what they're on. That's why it's so treacherous. And back then, being said that it's a sailboat, the reason why they didn't want to, um, they they well, I mean, they probably don't want to get stuck out there without any wind. Uh, supplies are short. You can't yeah. always. You can't just keep on hoarding supplies. I mean, they didn't really have any kind of refrigeration or anything like that back then, and. Yeah, that's. I just wanted to point out that it's a sailboat. I, yeah, that that could cause a whole lot of things if the wind yeah. wasn't right. Okay, well, we're in Acts twenty-seven, verse 
27, verse 13. It says, When a gentle south wind began to blow, they thought they had obtained what they wanted. So they weighed anchor and sailed along the shore of Crete. Before very long, a wind of hurricane force called the North Easter swept down from the island. The ship was caught by the storm and could not head into the wind. So we, there's that word we, that means Luke is with them. So we gave way to it and were driven along. As we passed to the lee of the small island called Kata, we were hardly able to make the lifeboat secure. When the men had hoisted it aboard, they passed ropes under the ship itself to hold it together, fearing that they would run aground on the sandbars of Sirtis. They lowered the sea anchor and let the ship be driven along. We took such a violent battering from the storm that the next day they began to throw the cargo overboard. On the third day, they threw the ship's tackle overboard with their own hands. When neither sun nor stars appeared for many days, and the storm continued raging, we finally gave up all hope of being saved. You know, Paul told them, you know, they, they should wait and not, not go, but now they're in the midst of a big storm. And, uh, and they were actually... Um, using cables to undergird the ship to keep it from breaking yeah. apart in the st storm. Yeah. So in verse 21 it says, After the men had gone a long time without food, Paul stood up before them and said, Now Paul's getting ready. He's standing up again and getting ready to speak again. Men, you should have taken my advice not to sail from Crete. Then you would have spared yourselves this damage and loss. But now I urge you to keep up your courage because not one of you will be lost. Only the ship will be destroyed. Last night an angel of, uh, of the God of uh, whose I am and whom I serve stood before me and said, Do not be afraid, Paul. You must stand trial before Caesar and God has graciously given you the lives of all who sail with you. So keep up your courage, men. For I have faith in God that it will happen just as he told me. Nevertheless, we must run aground on some island. You know, now they're going to listen to him. <laughs> they don't have a whole lot of choice yeah. now. Now they're going to listen to him. And uh, an angel of the Lord stood before him and he said, Do not be afraid. Has God ever told you to n never be afraid? He's told me, he says, Do not fear. Do not be afraid. And that's what that's the word for tonight. Do not be afraid. Amen. Amen. Do not be afraid. On the fourteenth night we were still being driven across the Adriatic Sea when about midnight the sailors sensed they were approaching land. They took soundings and found that the water was a hundred and twenty feet deep. A short time later, they took soundings again and found it was 90 feet deep. Fearing that we would be dashed against the rocks, they dropped four anchors from the stern and prayed for daylight. In an attempt to escape from the ship, the sailors let the lifeboat down to the sea, pretending they were going to lower some anchors from the bow. See, they, they didn't want to listen to Paul. They just wanted to get off the ship. Then Paul said to the centurion and the soldiers, Unless these men stay with the ship, you cannot be saved. So the soldiers cut the ropes that held the lifeboats and let it fall away. Uh, well, they were really, really listening to Paul. They let, If they cut the ropes of the lifeboat, let it go away. Yeah. yeah. That's when, when their ship was falling apart and stuff. Yeah. The old storm. Uh, in verse 33... It says, just before dawn, Paul urged them all to eat. For the past 14 days, he said, you have been in constant suspense and have gone without food. You haven't eaten anything, now I urge you to take some food. You need it to survive. Not one of you will lose a single hair from his head. After he said this, he took some bread and gave thanks to God in front of them all. Then he broke it and began to eat. They were all encouraged and ate some food themselves. 
Altogether, there were, there were 276 of us on board. When they had eaten as much as they wanted, <clears throat> they lightened the ship by throwing the grain into the sea. Man, these guys are losing everything. They're losing their cargo and and the stuff they were taking. And, and they could have had it off if they'd have listened to Paul back at Crete. But they didn't know to listen to him, I guess. They weren't being led by the Spirit, for one thing. You know. And in verse 39, it says, When daylight came, they did not recognize the land, but they saw a bay with a sandy beach, <clears throat> where they decided to run the ship aground if they could. Cutting loose the anchors, they left them in the sea, and at the same time untied the ropes that held the rudders. Then they hoisted the foresail to the wind and made, made for the beach. But the ship struck a sandbar and ran aground. The bow stuck fast and would not move, and the stern was broken to pieces by the pounding of the surf. The soldiers planned to kill the prisoners to prevent any of them from swimming away and escaping. But the centurion wanted to spare Paul's life and keep them from carrying out their plan. See, here's Paul still having that same favor. And God protecting his life, even if he has to protect everyone else's life with him, he's protecting yeah, Paul's sure. life. He, he ordered those who could swim to jump overboard first and get to land. The rest uh, were to get there on planks or on pieces of the ship. And this way, everyone reached land safely. So we find that they reached land safely. Praise God. Uh, do you want to read a pinch? Sure. Okay. <clears throat> I, I just wanted to say that I like how uh, Paul really did have favor. I mean, the centurion that heard the soldiers' plans to not let the prisoners have the opportunity to escape by killing them all, he was like, oh, well, that's no good. I can't have Paul die. I mean, Paul didn't even say anything to him, like, make sure they're not plotting this. He just kind of took it upon himself to come up with a different plan yeah. and kept them from carrying out their own. So I just I like that. And, and maybe awesome. that was some kind of military strategy. Maybe they did stuff like that in those days. If uh, if a shipwreck happened and there was prisoners, maybe that's something they did. They killed the prisoners so no one could escape. I don't know. It's very possible. Maybe they were planning on saying that they just died at sea because they couldn't swim or something yeah. like that. I don't know. Oh, they'd have gotten out of it one way or another. Yeah. <clears throat> that's true. Okay, in uh, chapter 28, verse 1. Now, when they had escaped, they then found out that the island was called Malta. And the natives showed us unusual kindness, for they kindled a fire and made us all welcome because of the rain that was falling and because of the cold. But when Paul had gathered a bundle of sticks and laid them on the fire, a viper came out because of the heat and fastened on his hand. So when the natives saw the creature hanging from his hand, they said to one another, no doubt this man is a murderer, whom though he, was ex though he has escaped the sea, yet justice does not allow to live. But he shook off the creature into the fire and suffered no harm. However, they were expecting that he would swell up or suddenly fall down dead. But after they had looked for a long time and saw no harm came to him, they changed their minds and said he was a god. Isn't that how fickle people are in human yeah. nature? Yeah, well, I mean, they don't know anything else. They're probably thinking this man just survived when nobody else ever has from that snake's bite. Yeah. Something that I like about this that I, I guess I overread because, I mean, whenever I read anything, I like to picture a story. I like to picture yeah. how it's happening. And <clears throat> I guess how I pictured this before, because it says that he was getting a bundle of sticks for the fire, and he put it on there, and then because of the heat, the snake jumped out. I was always thinking that the snake was hiding near the fire, or the snake was hiding further back, like over in the bush or something, and it came out of nowhere. But then I realized the snake came out of the bundle of sticks that he just yeah. threw on the fire. I mean... I mean, I, I figure everybody else probably noticed that, but I never have. So yeah. I just like that little, that, um, <clears throat> I guess, that picture in my mind of some of Paul taking a big bundle of sticks that he just gathered up so everybody can stay warm. And Snake didn't wake up. Yeah, the Snake didn't do anything. And all yeah. of a sudden he threw it on the fire and Snake gets mad, so it bites him. 
And I just think it's awesome that the snake didn't bite him <coughs> before he got to the fire. It, it could have woken up, but for some reason it was just chilling in that little bundle of sticks being carried from his home. Or maybe he was just hanging out with a bunch of sticks that day. I don't know, but I, I just think that it's kind of crazy <laughs> that Paul didn't get bitten before, but it was whenever he was in front of everybody to be yeah. able to see what God had done. Well, and that's true. So, I mean, it, it's all about the timing. It's, yeah. I think You're it's right. kind of crazy that the snake didn't bite him before. Yeah, before, yeah, he before got they there. were watching. Yeah, because otherwise it wouldn't even be in there. There wouldn't, any te- wouldn't be any testimony. And I would also like, and, and, and we're all, in case someone's wondering, well, how come it didn't bother him when the snake bit him? Well, Jesus... Uh, told us back in uh, Mark chapter um, 16 uh, when Jesus was giving the Great Commission and he was talking about believers, those that have accepted Jesus as their Lord and Savior. And it says uh, in verse 17, it says, And these signs will follow those who believe. In my name they will cast out demons. They will speak with new tongues. In verse 18, look what it says. They will take up serpents, and if they drink any deadly thing, it won't hurt them. Yeah. Wow. So, I mean, that's part of the Great Commission. It doesn't mean we should go around picking up snakes on no. purpose yeah. and, and have a... I mean, there's some churches that do that as part of their worship, but to me, that's like tempting God. But, oh but to me, this shows there's a promise that God has actually given about snakes. Yeah. And... and you know, Paul was following after God, and he just got delivered with, from a shipwreck. And plus, he has this promise to back him up. You know, he's not going to drop down dead now. No. You know, after yeah. he just escaped this shipwreck, you know, and God delivered him and everyone with him. But anyway, um, a lot of times when, well, God protects us, we were talking about how he had favor. If you look through the scriptures, you'll find scriptures regarding these things. Just like Joshua was sharing with us last week, how uh, you know Paul was appearing before kings and and, and giving tests and, and governors and giving a testimony. Well, that was already spoken. Jesus said that would happen. That was prophesied. You know, so uh, whenever you see these miracles happening, there's a scripture somewhere to back it up. It's, it's not just something that just happenstance happened. And it was, yes, it was in God's plan, but he has a scripture backing us up and protecting us with mm-hmm. his promises. Amen. And look at that testimony he gave those people. Yeah. Not, not that he was a God, but they started paying attention to him. You know, I'm sure he shared the gospel with them too. Did you have a comment? No. Okay, and so uh, where were we? Verse seven. five, seven. verse seven. Okay. Verse 7 of Acts 28, 7. In that region, there was an estate of the leading citizen of the island whose name was uh, Publius. Am I saying it right or is it Publius? Who received us and entertained us courteously for three days. Look at this favor. First they're out sitting around a campfire. Now they're inside this guy's estate. You know, and he's entertaining them for three days. Let's keep in mind, it says entertain this for three days. Um, do you believe that that's talking about the entire 276 people that Probably came from the ship? Paul and Luke. Just Paul. Some uh, select few. Yeah. I mean, okay. I'm sure he took care, they took, the whole island said took care of them, but I don't know that all of them were inside the estate. But Paul, yeah, Paul and Luke must have been. And At the least. group that was with yeah. them. Yeah, yeah. It wasn't a group. Maybe the centurion or the captain. I don't know. I was just thinking that if it was the whole group, how big must this guy's house be? But, I mean, he is in a small little <laughs> yeah. part of the island. And verse 8, And it happened that the father of uh, Publius lay sick of fever and dysentery. You know, he might have had malaria or something. I don't know, you know. And uh, he lay sick of a fever and dysentery. And Paul went in to him and prayed. And he laid his hands on him and healed him. And so when this was done, the rest of those on the island who had diseases also came and were healed. 
In verse 10, it says, And they also honored us in many ways, and when we departed, they provided such things as were necessary. Something yeah. that I like about all of that is, I, I'm going back to Mark chapter 16 that you just read, and verse 18 even, right after it talks about picking up uh, serpents with their hands and drinking deadly yeah. poison and then not harming them. It goes right into say, uh, and they, will they will lay their hands on the sick and they will recover. I think it's crazy the line of events that happens to Paul. First, yeah. uh, we talked about uh, how even Jesus said that they will go and speak before the rulers, governors, kings, yeah. and that's almost the exact order that it happens. Yeah. And then in this situation, he he picked up a serpent. The serpent ended up biting him once he got to the fire and threw it on the fire. And he didn't die, and then he went off and he laid hands on on the father of uh, Publius, and then the rest of the people are like, "Oh my goodness, you know, after seeing this and that, I want to be healed too. I want I want this to happen to me also." And and it all happened from him getting bit by a snake right on time. And as as you know, this is part of sharing the gospel, even though it doesn't say he preached the gospel. This he must have shared it, yeah. but this itself, these acts, you know, when Jesus gave the great commission, it it, it includes all this that happened to Paul. You know, the snake, yeah. the laying hands on the sick. This is sharing the gospel. Yeah. This is showing the power of God. Yeah. And and it said that Paul prayed and he laid hands on him. Well, you know, when he prayed, he prayed God's word. He's sharing yeah, the gospel. True. He's sharing the gospel with them. That's true. Well, you're getting ready to find out in verse 11 that uh, they're getting ready to set out in a, in a ship, Alexandrian ship, and uh, that had wintered there. I mean, these guys even come up with a ship for them, you know. That's I know. Awesome. And they were there for yeah. three months, it says. It says after yeah. three months we sailed in verse 11. What do you want me to read? Uh, it's just up to you. In verse 11 of Acts 28, it says, After three months we put out to sea in a ship that had wintered in the island. It was an Alexandrian ship with the figurehead of the twin gods of Castor and Pollux. We put in at Syracuse and stayed there three days. From there we set sail and arrived at R Regium. The next day the south wind came up, and on the following day we reached Puteoli. There we found some brothers who invited us to spend a week with them, and so we came to Rome. The brothers there had heard that we were coming, and they traveled as far as Forum of Appius and the three taverns to meet us. At the sight of these men, Paul thanked God and was encouraged. When we got to Rome, Paul was allowed to live by himself with a soldier to guard him. Look at this favor that keeps following mm -hmm. Paul. He's allowed to live by himself, and, and I'm sure this guard was probably later saved after uh, yeah. having been with Paul. Yeah, I wonder years. how many of people may have been saved just that were on that ship and, and then they were on the island. Yeah, definitely. But we're going to find out Paul's preaching uh, at Rome under guard. It says in verse 17, Three days later he called together the leaders of the Jews, when they had assembled, Paul said to them, My brothers, although I have done nothing against our people or against the customs of our ancestors, I was arrested in Jerusalem and handed over to the Romans. They examined me and wanted to release me because I was not guilty of any crime deserving death. But when the Jews objected, I was compelled to appear, appeal to Caesar, not that I had any charge to bring against my own people, uh, for this reason I have asked to see you and talk with you. It is because of the hope of Israel that I am bound with this chain. They replied, We have not received any letters from Judea concerning you, and none of the brothers who have come from there has reported or said anything about, bad about you. But we want to hear what your views are, for we know that people everywhere are talking against this sect. They arrived to meet Paul on a certain day and came in even larger numbers to the place where he was staying. From morning till evening, he explained and declared to them the kingdom of God and tried to convince them about Jesus from the law of Moses and from the prophets. 
Some were convinced by what he said, and, but others would not believe. They disagreed among themselves and began to leave after Paul had made this final statement. The Holy Spirit spoke the truth to your forefathers when he said through Isaiah the prophet, Go to this people and say, You will ever... You will be ever hearing it, but never understanding. You will be ever seeing, but never perceiving. For this people's heart has become callous. They hardly hear with their ears. They have closed their eyes. Otherwise, they might see with their eyes, hear with their ears, understand with their hearts, <coughs> and turn, and I would heal them. Therefore, I want you to know that God's salvation has been sent to the Gentiles, and they will listen. For two whole years, Paul stayed there in his own rented house and welcomed all who came to see him. Boldly and without hindrance, he preached the kingdom of God and taught about the Lord Jesus Christ. I like that. For two years. I really, I like uh, that. I guess it's, I think it's from like Isaiah 6, 9, and 10. Yeah. Which is part of my sermon on Sunday. Yeah, uh, I just I like seeing Paul use it. I like seeing Paul apply it and kind of describe it perfectly. That yeah. I like that a lot, just because uh, I'll, he was talking to the Jews and these Jews hadn't even heard from the Jews over in Jerusalem, no. and they didn't even know. They knew that um, the sect that they were calling it that was Christianity. Um, they're saying, yeah, we've heard that it was spoken against, but we haven't heard anything bad yeah. about you from. Uh, any of whenever they said brothers, they were talking about the other Jewish believers. The, or the ruling uh, Jews, actually. I, yeah. I when I say Jewish, I didn't mean Jewish Christians. I meant like Jewish. Yeah, yeah. Like they uh, they practice, I guess Orthodox Jews. I don't know. I don't know <laughs> what all those different terms mean. Anyways, they. I just mean like the the Jewish people, those that still practice the old law and followed the old law. And everything, and they didn't know anything about Jesus yet. Those people, right? Um, I, I just like how he says at the very end because they're starting to disagree amongst each other. They they like listening to Paul, but then like some of them, you know, kind of sparks against. Some agreed and some yeah. didn't. Some and so listened, they, some didn't. Yeah, yeah, they start arguing amongst each other, and then I just like him saying the Holy Spirit was right and saying to your fathers through Isaiah the prophet. And I just, I really like that. You know, you you will hear, but not understand. You're going to see, but yeah. you're not really going to perceive. And he's just saying all this stuff. And then he said, so I'm going to go to the Gentiles with this gospel. Because because he did try. And, and I what I like about this is the fact that Isaiah said this after God told him to. And it almost sounds like God's giving up on them, but... Isaiah said it. He's trying to reach them. And Paul, he tried to reach all. He went Every time he went to a different town, he'd always go to the Jews first. And he'd try to reach yeah. them first. And if they didn't hear, he didn't let that stop him from spreading it on to others, to the Gentiles, yeah. to those and who... And this was prophesied by Isaiah as mm -hmm. well. Yeah. He, I mean, God prophesied that that when they wouldn't receive him, they would go, the message would go to the Gentiles and then some of them would get jealous and all that. It, it, this was yeah. all prophesied. It wasn't something just happening in the New Testament. But it makes me wonder. It just makes me wonder. How did they take this whenever he said this? Because every Jew knew the law because they didn't, they didn't have like their own Bibles or, some, or a scroll that they carried around everywhere, but yeah. they had heard the prophets... Uh, spoken to them from a young age they probably memorized them they oh, yeah. probably knew this verse they probably had at least yeah. heard it before and so whenever he said it and it dawned on them that it could apply it was probably almost a slap in the face to the ones yeah, that weren't yeah. believing and yeah. it probably just angered them even more like how dare you say that about yeah. us I just I like it because it's something they had heard their whole lives and whenever it's applied against them yeah. it probably infuriated them but at the yeah. same time I, I can't help but wonder how many of them, even though they either got mad or didn't agree, but those words kept resounding in their ears later, you know, That's true. and, and yeah. possibly converted later. You know, you never That's know. That's very true. <laughs> well, I think uh, we just finished the book of Acts. We're going to stop right there. And as always, uh, we're going to give you an opportunity to be led in a salvation prayer uh, I'm going to turn it over to my wife Susan and uh, she's going to say a prayer and she's probably going to give a few announcements and uh, here she is 
Well, thank you for joining us. And, um, and like Pastor Steve was saying, if you've never accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you know, this book of Acts and this Bible, that's God's words to you. It's, it's so exciting what God has for believers and what we were reading in Mark uh, chapter 16. These are for believers. God won't leave you. He won't forsake you. He'll, he will be with you always, even until the end. He'll be with you forever. And so I would like to invite you to accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior tonight. And if you want to do that, I want to share, I want to pray with you. And everyone here is going to help repeat this prayer with you. Father in heaven, Father in heaven, thank you for sending your son Jesus. Thank you for sending your son Jesus to die on the cross for my sins. To die on the cross for my sins. And thank you God for raising him from the dead. And thank you God for raising him from the dead. That I might live a life of victory. That I might live a life of victory. Jesus, Jesus, forgive me of my sins. Forgive me of my sins. Come into my heart. Come into my heart. And be Lord of my life. And be Lord of my life. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Now, if you prayed that prayer and you believed it in your heart, you are a child of God. Get in the Word of God. Start reading it. These are God's words for you today. And um, if you don't have a Bible, go get you a Holy Bible. Uh, you can get it on the Internet. You can read on the, I think it's called the Blue Book. And you know. can get it on your uh, iPhone a lot of times. But... Go go to a Walmart store. Get a Holy Bible. Go to a used bookstore. If you have a Bible on your bookshelf you haven't ever read or hadn't read it for a long time, dust it off and open it up and, and pray and ask God to reveal the truth to you. And join us. Every Tuesday night we have a Bible study at, uh, at 7 o'clock Central Time. Join us. And if you have questions, uh, you may uh, send it to our website or send it to... Uh, Haynes Ministries at gmail.com. Ask us questions. Go to our website, HaynesMinistries.org. Um, join us. Learn more about God. If you've accepted Jesus tonight, let us know. If you want us to send you some uh, helps about your new walk with God, we'll be glad to do that. And also, we have a, a church service live streamed, 6 o'clock p.m., a central time on on every sunday hope family church meets please join us we we're always blessed by the word of god that amen. comes forth amen. god bless you amen until next time god bless <laughs>